Okay, okay, we are recording. Perfect, thank you. Hi everybody and welcome to today's webinar. We're excited to have you join us. Today we're gonna to be chatting about how Salesforce connects sales and customer success to power the expansion sale. Before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few housekeeping items so we can make today's event as interactive as possible. You have all joined the presentation muted and you'll remain muted throughout the duration of the webinar. However, you will have the opportunity to use both your chat and Q&A box throughout the presentation. As Caroline mentioned, to find those Q&A and chat boxes, simply hover at the bottom of your screen and you'll see your Q&A chat options. Submit any of the questions that you have for the panelists using the Q&A box, and then you're gonna use the chat box to answer any questions that the panelists may ask, ask you. So be sure to select the blue bar at the bottom that says, all panelists and attendees so that others can see what you have to say as well. Feel free to send in questions at any time during today's event. Tim and Larry will be answering them throughout the presentation. Just as a quick reminder, we will be sending the recording and the slide deck within the next 20 or within 24 hours after the event. So keep an eye out for that. So with that, let's go ahead and get started here to kick off the content and introduce our special guest is tim reister the chief strategy officer here at corporate visions and author of the expansion sale over to you tim all right thanks marissa hey it's my pleasure today to be joined by larry Schertz, uh executive vice president at salesforce larry and i were we shared the stage larry in february um one of the last stages i was on at least before covid uh, at your sales kickoff. And it was the same month that we introduced our new book, The Expansion Sale. And uh, at that time, you, you talked uh, uh, that, and I don't think this is untrue for most of the companies on this call today, that the expansion of existing customers is a, an important part of your business and growth strategy. So uh, we're going to talk about that, but welcome. Good to see you again. Uh, and uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. Good to see you. And yeah, that was our that was our last large event. Everything everything got super uh, super different after that. So we we greatly appreciate the partnership with you and, and the entire corporate visions team. So it's good to see you. Well, same here. I uh, I'm excited to to take this conversation uh, to this next level because uh, this is a group I'm assuming who are here today for a reason and. Uh, that is that you uh, live in a SaaS world and you have, you worry about expanding existing customers, keeping existing customers. And it's exciting to have Larry here because I don't know, I've been around long enough and I think Larry's been around long enough. I'm, I, I can't write Salesforce there. That's not what I was going to write. Uh, Larry, what I'm going to, what I remember, and uh, I'm sure I was just a, a young guy at the time was when I went to a trade show, probably around 1999 or 2000, everybody had these buttons on and it said software and they were just simply a circle with a line through it saying no software. And it was you guys, it was Salesforce turning the industry upside down. Am I right? Timing wise, was that around that time? Uh, it was company has been around for 22 years and it, and I think uh, things really started to, to transform for us as not just as an organization, but inside of an industry that was, that was ripe for that transition. You know, we, we really started the company with a super simple premise of buying software and, and leveraging software should be as easy as buying a book on Amazon. And, you know, when that becomes like your guiding principle and your vision, that's a very different world than what was the traditional perpetual license sale where you spend years and years implementing and, and you have a tough time realizing value. So, yeah, so I was, uh, I've been with the company for 10 years and I remember those from a seat that I was in in a different company, seeing <laughs> all of those badges and everything else. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, was, it was a marketing uh, move that was pure genius, I think, at the time. But if you think about it, this is what's interesting. I only have data that goes back to 2008. So I'm gonna put 2008 here. The SaaS market that we're talking about was just 5.6 billion. It's not that long to say 12 years. So in 2020, they're projecting this market's now gonna be 157 billion. So there are a lot of companies out there in the SaaS market, the no software market, that had to think about not only a new business model, but a new customer relationship model and so what we're going to do with our agenda today, and Larry's going to kind of walk us through this, is 
as really the, the grandparents of SAS, uh, you guys have learned a lot of things. And, and folks on the phone or on the webcast, I'm guessing you want to know about these four things. Number one, you want to understand how AEs and the emerging CS uh, account management sort of organization work together because this is a new intercompany, intracompany relationship that's required to do well in this business. You want to understand uh, what it takes to renew. Um, it's uh, renewing is, is the new selling now. It's, uh, it's a selling motion and it uh, requires certain disciplines and skills. Customer vision, this idea of, hey, you, you need to expand. It, there's, I think this business, Larry, if you, I don't think the words land and expand existed before the SaaS world came about. So um, that's, everybody wants to know because it, honestly, the first deal isn't the most important deal. It's probably the next and the next and the next. And then finally, everybody wants to know how to prove value. And so today, this is my promise. Really, it's Larry's promise. He's driving. I'm just annotating. We're going to touch on these four things. And uh, that's what you're here for. So let's, let's dive right into it. Awesome. So let's talk about the no handoffs idea. This idea here with no handoffs is that I'm going to just draw a picture up here where you engage with a, uh, a prospect and then, yay, you win the business. And then hopefully, yay, you renew the business. And I'm just going to sort of draw what I assume everybody, you know, could see up here, which is somewhere along the way, you're evolving that business, you're expanding it and growing it. So the idea of no handoffs and the world of AE and CS, uh, talk about what this looks like, how, what you guys have figured out in terms of this optimal relationship, the no handoffs, I didn't make that up. Those are your words. So tell me about that. Yeah, I think, you know, for, for us, it, it is very value rooted in, in how we've just organized the company and how we, how we've grown the company. So trust and customer success are two of our core values and trust is our most important value. And that is really embedded in our DNA. So those become the most important factors of how we engage with our customers. And if, if those are our guiding factors or whatever the values are of the folks on the phone, those become, you know, how you develop your processes, how you rate, you know, recruit and retain your people and everything else. So for us, success is, is a process. It's not an event. And as, and as you're, as you're drawing here, you know, and, and whether there's three dots here or five dots here, you know, however our customers think about um, this cycle, um, the, the concept of handoffs, in our opinion, breaks down trust for our customers. When we have an AE engaging and then we, there's a deal that gets done or we close an opportunity and then it's thrown over the wall uh, to customer success and then it's thrown over the wall to a renewals team for those of you on the phone that have renewals teams, those, those things in our experience end up breaking down trust. And as a core value of our company, that's just something that shouldn't happen. So when you're thinking about success as a process and not an event, you start realizing these highly collaborative, seamless processes, Tim, to your point, across the entire organization. Um, so as an organization, we think about breaking down silos between sales and customer success and the different teams that engage with our customers. We think about pervasive processes, not linear processes. And, and we always will draw this back to what's the most important thing for the customer and how do we continue to build trust um, in, in less of a sequential process, more of a pervasive process. And then most importantly at that renewal point, which is really just an event, you know, a renewal is just an event. At the end of a contract, something's going to happen. Just because you're renewing doesn't mean you've done enough to earn that customer's trust. You haven't done enough potentially to be successful along what matters. And I know we'll talk about that later. Um, but ideally this renewal event, this is, this is a cycle here. This isn't just a sequential parallel process. And I think for not just for Salesforce, but anybody in the SaaS market, when you're doing this and this is a cycle, then you're in a pretty good spot and you're putting the customer first and you're building trust along the way. Well, one of the things I remember you guys saying at that conference was, uh, I might misquote it, but you can fix it. Um, 
AEs will be joined with CS by like step two of a sales cycle. Like it isn't like you said, it isn't like you uh, engage a customer, you win the business and then CS shows up. You guys are engaging CS early. Uh, I think to quote you early and often is what you yeah. said there. Uh, so talk about that, um, how that works. Cause I mean, that it sounds like, okay, we all wanted to avoid too many legs on a sales call, but you've obviously discovered that this is integral. Yeah, I, you know, for us, it, it, this has just become a part of the motion. The, this has just become, quite candidly, a competitive differentiator for us. Our customer success teams are competitive differentiators. And more and more, and if you, this goes back to the earlier conversation a little bit, Tim, the, this is not a perpetual license world where customers are spending a lot of money on software and then implementing that over three to four years and they, they just kind of own it and success isn't a metric right? This is software as a service. So the way we see it and what we hear from our customers is I want to know what success is going to look like along this journey. I want to know what you're doing in this org as an organization to put skin in the game. I want to know the team that's going to be on site here, helping mobilize and deploy and enable and help measure success. And the earlier we do that, or any of us on this, on this webcast, the earlier we do that in the Sale, sales cycle, like this kind of isn't a sell cycle. This is a customer engagement cycle. The earlier we do that, the better. And that's just the feedback we've gotten from customers along this journey that I want to know the team that's going to be here helping me make us successful. We trust your technology. We know you're highly innovative. Like we get all of that, but help me understand what success looks like. So we have moved that customer success motion very, very early in this customer engagement cycle or prospect engagement cycle, if you will. Yeah. And then it's all throughout. And then as you mentioned, it's, it's, it flows in a circular way. That's awesome. So I'm going to pause there on the no handoffs idea and that the AECS combo is an early and often strategy at, whereas success now is a process. It's not a function or an event. And I'm going to ask you to use your chat box. Um, in the chat box, I want you to think of a scale of uh, one to five. I didn't leave myself much room to write here. <laughs> I want you in the chat box to write a one, two, three, or four, or five. One, oh crap, we're nowhere near this. Or five, totally nailed it. We are a no handoffs company. This makes total sense. So in the chat box, one, two, three, four, five. Let's see what you guys are saying here. So twos and ones and threes and twos and ones. All right. So this is this is a bunch of threes that you're doing pretty well. St Stephanie's got a four, so awesome. But I'm going to say it's threes and belows um, that there's room for improvement here. And maybe some of these ideas and phrases that uh, Larry gave you today uh, will be helpful as you go back maybe take this recording and, and go back and say, you know, uh, the granddaddy of all SaaS companies has learned this is the way you need to engage. So thanks everybody. It's, I'm gonna say definitely a lot of twos and ones and that this is kind of a, a news flash for folks, not a news flash in that they didn't know it needed to happen, but they are struggling to make it happen. So given that that's the case Larry, maybe one more question on this slide. What was sort of like the breakthrough moment that brought the groups together? How did, because I'm guessing the reason this isn't happening in these companies isn't because people went, oh, they should work together. It's probably some organizational inertia or challenge they're facing. Yeah, I, for us, it, it's always going to rotate towards the customer. And, and I would tell you that we, we respond incredibly quickly to customer needs and customer focus. And the, the intersection of I, how our portfolio has grown, as you, as you mentioned, Tim, when we started, this was about contact management. This was about opportunities. This was what, this really wasn't CRM at that point. This was Salesforce automation mm -hmm. 22 years ago, right? Now this is an entire market and you've already described the growth of this. This is about marketing. This is about sales. This is about service. This is about communities. This is about enablement. This is about data and integration. This is about how do I how do I manage analytics, right? So that while that market, as that market has evolved, rather, and as we've engaged more deeply with our customers, and as they've engaged more deeply in our portfolio, 
it's just become a requirement that success becomes the next predicating factor for our growth inside of our customers and our customers ability to leverage our solutions. It just became something that it just has to happen. Um, so I would tell you it was very customer driven. Um, and it's, it was a long time ago that we realized as the portfolio grew and as the buying motion grew, we had to make that pivot. And that makes a ton of sense because as it gets more complicated, there's just the more moving parts. And I think this question that just popped up from Jim kind of speaks to that. And he says, can you spend a quick second on the difference between a linear process and a pervasive process? What is, what is quick second on that, Larry? Yeah. Um, thanks for the question, Jim. So uh, the linear, when I was describing linear, kind of how Tim drew this out um, so that you, you can think of this as just linearly or horizontally running through your organization, right? Silo to silo, it just kind of kicks over a wall. When I think about a pervasive process, and we use this phrase at Salesforce a lot, customer success is everyone's job. Everyone's job. It is embedded in the DNA. So when I say pervasive, I made the comment about trust being core to the DNA. Customer success is core to our DNA. So everyone rallies to customer success cries inside of Salesforce. It, it just is a mantra inside the company. So it isn't necessarily one person's job inside of their silo. If we have a customer success opportunity, um, it's, in, it's in embedded in the entire organization. It's in the, it's in the, the framework. And is that, uh, and you don't have to go too far if you can't go, but I mean, is that then sort of a, a documented motion that they just know, oh, I'm, you know, we're slotting in here. I mean, it's pervasive because most sales process and most processing companies is linear. It looks like I drew it and it's so hard to draw pervasive. <laughs> I don't have enough dimensions here, but uh, so is that something that can be documented in a way that pe that all teams can sort of jump in on it? Yeah, I think um, it's, it's an interesting point. It, it, there is a there's just a tribal knowledge of that is how we how we organize our organization. I mean, it just is inside of our company. Mm -hmm. When I started ten years ago, we were you know call it thirty six hundred employees. We're fifty five thousand employees now. That's grown both organically and through acquisitions. And we've never really had a challenge of people coming to the organization saying, "Why? Well, like, I'm not sure I understand that customer success motion. How does that work? Shouldn't you just throw it over the wall?" It's one of the, it's like, you don't really train people on Google. People figure it out, right? So for us, this is just a, you see this in how we behave every day. You see this in how we organize our vision and values and the things that are important inside of our company. It just, it's just an ism. So I, I would tell you it's culturally embedded here um, and people pick it up pretty quickly. Yeah, and if, if you don't. <laughs> You know, yeah. it's just one of those things, right? I guess I love it. I think that may be one of the problems that these companies who are giving us ones and twos is there's, there's a, it, they're linear companies, they're event companies, they're silo companies, and, and the culture hasn't evolved to uh, be so pervasive. And uh, so that can't be underestimated. It can't just be a, hey, I'm going to document something and now everybody can follow it on paper. It, it, there has to be a spirit about it. Yeah, I think to that, to that topic, I would tell you probably every company, and we, we do this pretty consistent. It's like, what, what is important to us? What, what are our values? And are, have we oriented the organization around those values? And if customer success is a value of your organization, it's an opportunity for all of us to think about, okay, well then have we organized that way? Are we resourced that way? Do our investments follow that value? Do people live, eat, and breathe that value? And it's worth just, it's worth calibrating on that for, for all the organizations of, you know, what's really important to you. And if customer success is, then we, you know, then there's, there's always room for growth there. Always. Yeah. And we got to press on, but we could talk all day, but, and then customer life cycle is a good place to talk about this. Customer success kind of came out as a category and, and then it became a title and a department. And maybe that was part of the problem is that, we, we called it something and then we're like, oh good, they've got that taken care of. And it became all of a sudden unwittingly a silo. Thoughts? Uh, it, it has that opportunity to be, you know, a, a department's responsibility. This goes back to what, what we just a little bit talked about. And, and mm -hmm. you know, for me, these topics are so interrelated. It's, right. it's tough to draw some boxes, but 
I, you know, when, when it's when it's one department's job, and if it's a core value of your company, those are asynchronous concepts, right? Mm -hmm. it, it it either is a core value of your organization, which means it's everyone's job and it's really important, or it's a department's job and people will always just point fingers and expect them to take care of it. Something like customer success at Salesforce, it's too important. It's just a must. And if you think about it, for us, and, and you talked about land and expand or use that, that language earlier, the, mm -hmm. the, the reality is that, you know, the land and expand could be a line of business opportunity. It could be a product opportunity inside of a line of business. You can really kind of start anywhere with a lot of the companies that are on the phone here. I'm sure, you know, we have portfolios of products, if you will. So you have this start anywhere portfolio and that can either be a success, what I would call a success snowball, or that can be a stalled opportunity. And it all revolves around the customer success. And when you're doing that right, um, and when we're doing that right, we know that that success piece is the single largest contributing factor for our next opportunity. And we'll talk later about how we think about that and how we socialize that and everything else. But um, you know, when you've got the product portfolio we do along, as I talked about, we call it the customer 360. It's how do we think about engagement and all of our solutions along the things I mentioned, and you're releasing three products per year, and you're somewhere in a customer's vision executing somewhere, that success piece is so critical in that life cycle and your engagement with that customer, it has to be job one has to be job one or you'll you'll face the ramifications down down the road yeah i mean customer 360 if you don't do well on like let's say this is customer 15 i'm just going to use your analogy 360 degrees you'll be stuck at at 15 and right. the reality is for the the vision is if for your customer to be a success they've got to hit on all cylinders and for you to be a success, you have to hit on all those cylinders. So, but land is we get the first 15 degrees and then you're working your way, I'm guessing around. And uh, I love that it, you either get stuck at where you landed and you're like, and some companies are like, oh, good. I just want to hunker down and hold that. But most want to snowball it. I love your words and expand. So yeah. just walk me through, let's talk about this. Like how does this just sort of show up as part of a, cadence or um, an experience to ensure that this happens on purpose versus by accident? Yeah, well, I, you know, in, for our world, this is, this is, we, we really think about the account director or the account manager or the AE in the language that you use, Tim, to quarterback the importance of all of these topics for our customers, right? Now, and, and we're in a very matrix team organization where you've got a lot of resources to help support our customers. And normally that is the account executive that is coordinating and marshalling all of these resources to help our customers to be successful. And the reality is all of us know on this webcast is it, it's, this isn't just always a tools thing, right? It's not always a technology thing. There's process opportunities, there's culture opportunities inside of our customers. There's a lot of things that lend towards success or lack of success. And in our world, the, our account executives are responsible for being the captains of all of those resources with a 100% mindset on customer success and getting the right resources to the right places at the right time. So what, uh, if we look along the way here, um, are there specific motions? Are there specific timings? Are there trigger events? How do you look at, um, between land and expand, right? So I know renew is, is, a, is an event, but you know, if you back it off, there's gotta be, you know, there's a, probably something to make sure that you're hitting all the milestones and touchstones to ensure renewal. And then I'm guessing like, since they're a customer, you're maybe engaging in regular reviews and things like that, where you're trying to introduce you know, the next, uh, the next part of the 360 is, am I close and what does that look like? Yeah, I think that's right. And, and again, all it's, it's tough to think of if you pick 10 customers, 
they aren't all in the exact same piece of this life cycle, right? So they're somewhere along their journey. But if you think of this as we've engaged in an opportunity, um, we have a certain one of our clouds, a piece of our portfolio that is being actively deployed. That may be on a certain renewal cycle. We may have other pieces of our technology. It's on a piece of a renewal cycle. Some of our customers have everything on one renewal cycle. So there's complexity in each of these customers and they're, I, I hesitate to call them each a snowflake, but they are all different, right? And in, in where we are in the journey. But I would tell you that regardless of that process, what, what we all in this industry need to be thinking about is that renewal activity is an event. Um, what you're doing inside of that renewal activity to drive success is important. You can't start thinking about success. So in, in your example here, Tim, if you just put 12 months next to renew, I know we're running out of slide room, but <laughs> let's say that you signed a, a one-year a one year deal or three year, whatever the time frame is, you can't start thinking about success a month before the renewal period. It's too late, right? Success is a process and it takes time. So, you know, whatever that process is for all of us, it is important to think about what is a backing up period that says, I need to have the right level of rigor and discipline and executive sponsorship, and I need to be reporting on our results and our success on the projects. I need to be able to deliver back to the customer. Well, okay, we agreed that these were the expected business outcomes. We're tracking well on two of these, you know, traffic lighted, this one's yellow. We need to have that rigor early in the process because if you start thinking about success too late, it will be too late. And you're either gonna risk the renewal which isn't good for you or the customer, or that renewal is just gonna be a renewal and they aren't gonna be expanding because you haven't done a good job creating enough success early on. So I think there's multiple pieces inside of that, whatever for all of us here, whatever that, that period inside of the agreement contract term is, technically that customer success motion has to start on day one. And if you're doing it right, that customer success motion has actually started much earlier in engagement before just an event of a contract was signed. If you're engaging your customer success teams, uh, you know, the way they could be and should be engaged. Um, so some Pam has a question here. It says your highest, she said a comment, maybe your highest level exec team needs to be organized in a way that drives these handoffs and supports it ongoing. So culture is one thing, but yeah, you know, that, that's got to just be lived, right? Yeah, and, and Pam, on, uh, and I think this is what you're on both sides of the fence, but for, this is the customer responsibility and this is the, call it the seller, the, the partner responsibility. That alignment and the sponsorship piece, um, as we've evolved and we've been engaging in more and more digital transformations, uh, more critical path initiatives, that executive sponsorship is an imperative. Um, it's an absolute imperative to success. So I 100% agree. It's on. It's on both sides, building the relationships and going back to that trust piece. Those relationships really matter when it comes down to trust. Good. Thanks for the questions. Keep them coming. So, here's some things that I think uh, you started to say that I want to capture in this next idea of, of like customer vision. It's there's a cadence to renewals. There's there's a set of activities like business reviews, executive sponsorship, measurements, and all that. Um, but there's also, in your guys' case, and again, maybe it's the maturity of the organization here, and maybe it's also the, the breadth of the organization, um, what drives, as I understand it, your ongoing business relationship and customer success is also sort of a vision cast. You mentioned the 360. And so how much of your customer success and sales integration is, is, is helping people see where they are on, let's say, the journey? I think that the, most of our customer engagements start with a vision and that vision, and I'm sure it's the same for most of the folks on this call, that vision can be very, very wide. We want an engagement layer across our entire organization, customer mindset. Um, we, we have a line of business opportunity that we have a vision for transforming inside of that line of business. We, we will always start with what is the vision, i.e. what do you want? 
what, what are what are your expected outcomes? What, what how does the world look different at the end of this when we're successful? And then we start breaking down. Okay, now we're into where do we think low hanging fruit is? Where do we think the biggest bang for the opportunity or biggest bang for the dollar is? It, all in the uh, kind of bucket of where should we start? Okay, so for us it's an and conversation, vision and execution, vision and where do you start? Uh, to Pam's point, you know, a big piece of this is sponsorship and the rigor and the process and the cadence. We use a, a method with, with our customers where we, we have an alignment mechanism um, that I think a lot of people have heard about called the V2 mom. It helps us align the vision and the values and the methods, methods meaning how are we gonna go get this work done? What do we think is in the way of accomplishing these things? How do we measure success? And then that V2 mom becomes a measurement process between how we engage with our customer, our rigor, how do we measure success? And then, you know, typically we will have that really high level vision that guides everything that we're doing between our companies. So and for us, it's an and conversation. The vision you have to have, the execution path to delivering the results and getting the business measurements that you're looking for, you have to have one without the other. I think we end up falling short. Well, how often is a vision when you engage, and I'm sure this is across the board, where you identify a start, but you're like, hey, and, and this, is, this is where you go next, and this makes sense next, and you create sort of a, a journey map for them, and, and there's like, hey, but we're going to start here and get low-hanging impact, uh, low-hanging fruit, initial impact. We're going to measure that process. But when you go into renewal conversations, how often is it like you already know, hey, as we come to the end of this successful engagement, here's, here's what's next. And, and then, and if, you know, assuming that that makes sense, here's what's next. Uh, versus you come in and you land. And the idea is then you got to look at what they're doing. Let's just say they're an analytics cloud. And then you got to look at the white space and try to figure out what might be adjacent or next. How, how, important and how often is it that you already kind of know what's adjacent and next because you have mapped the vision to the portfolio so people have an expectation versus you're coming to a renewal let's let's see if we can lob in something else and um and take advantage of some success that's what i'm curious about uh, and um and then it, i'm gonna let you answer that question first before i ask you the next one fair i ideal state Ideal state is, and, and we call this road mapping, exactly what you've articulated here and drawn out here. Ideal state is that we've established a roadmap. Now, the, the questions always become, okay, what are the timing of these events? What is the timing of 2.0? What is the timing of 3.0? What is the timing of 4.0? But that road mapping exercise, also how that relates to our product development and innovation roadmap is hugely important for our customers because they want to know what's next. Now, keep that in mind. It's also, you also can't take your eye off the ball around customer success, right? If, if we're always thinking what's V2, what's V3, V4, and we aren't focusing on customer success, those aren't going to happen until we get there on the first one. But I think for a lot of our customers, that road mapping and then the consistent rigor and cadence is super important. I'll go back to that renewal event it is just an event. It is, um, you either have a vote of confidence or a vote of no confidence, if you will. So the customer success motion, is, it's an imperative. You aren't going to expand without it. But that road mapping exercise is something that we like to do up front. That will always shift. Um, this is the beauty of the SaaS solutions today is with agile development methodology, we can move quickly. So a lot of the trouble that earlier perpetual license companies had was, hey, that's a great vision. By the time we get there, the world will be completely different. So why even do that exercise? We're in a different game today where we can deploy capabilities quickly. Um, so I think that lends more credence to the road mapping exercise, but it's still super important to align on the vision and understand where those gates are and how we think about success along the way. Yeah, and I guess uh, I'm going to ask the audience then on your chat box again. So let's talk about 
this idea of road mapping with a customer so that when you when you land, there's there's a vision for expand and a path to expand versus just a hope that when we come to renewal, we can shove something else at them at, that makes sense. Because I know a lot of companies do white space analysis, Larry, and they they say, oh, um, and 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 maybe that's you. You acquire a new company, you're going to do some white space analysis to see who who needs the new thing. But ideally, there's there's a roadmap, and you could show where it fits in the roadmap. So on, on the chat, I just want to see on a scale of one to five again, chatters, five being we roadmap with our customers and there is a strategy and a customer vision that really we're executing against when it comes to customer success and sales or one OSM. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're just hoping to secure the renewal and maybe do a little upsell when we get there. So uh, let's is see. Is OSM a widely known acronym? <laughs> All right. I don't like to swear on webcast, but it's an oh shit moment. So there you go. So one, uh, it, all right, so I've got Gerald. Already know ahead of time what the industry threats and opportunities and everything is based on driving share price for the customer and customer's customer. We'll talk about customer's customer in a little bit. So congratulations, uh, Gerald, you're being featured on the next webcast. Um, <laughs> uh, but we're still at a lot of twos and a lot of ones. And um, so road mapping as a strategy uh, looks like it's an opportunity for most people on here. Anybody who's got a, a land and expand, I, you know, their portfolio is bigger than their initial hook, right? Uh, a road mapping strategy makes some sense. So varies by seller and by customer relationship. All right, Larry, let's talk about that a little bit. Like road mapping as a skill for your teams and road mapping as something customers accept and willingly participate in. Um, what, any secrets there that you could share? Because those, those are good ones, right? Like road mapping, what an ideal state. Um, but my customers don't want to have that discussion. They don't want to give us the data. They don't want to blah, blah, blah. And gee, my team, uh, I, what kind of rock stars do I need to run road mapping? Yeah, I, the, so for the customer relationship piece, I think is the most, is the, is the greatest determinant factor where we have very strong customer relationships, very senior C-suite customer relationships, the concept of road mapping and a, a, a relationship with greater perpetuity makes a ton of sense. Where we may be early in our land strategy, it's a net new prospect, net new customer, and we're selling you know, a very small number of licenses in a pilot motion, or we're proving ourselves out in that environment, a little more difficult to say, hey, I know we're just trying to get to know each other. Let's talk about your next five-year strategic roadmap <laughs> and bring us into your ELT meeting so that we can share our, you know, our worth. We do have those situations because we're blessed and humbled by the opportunity, innovation that we've brought organically and through acquisition. So a lot of times we do get those audiences to at a minimum even just advise, what are we seeing within a specific industry or what are we seeing outside of a specific industry that could be applicable to our industry, best practice types of conversations at the board level. But it really, uh, the customer relationship piece to Pam's comment, I, I think for us is the largest determining factor. When we're early in relationships and we're building trust and we haven't had a long period of time, that road mapping exercise um, is a little less valuable than where we've been there for a while. We have, you know, our, our brand is well established. We have trust at the C-suite. So I think that matters. And it's, a, by the way, it's a great journey to be on. We, we, like that's a great journey for our teams to engage on and be able to build that trust. Um, because when we do that, it's, it's a beautiful spot to be talking about a roadmap and have a more strategic impact on our customers. But yeah, that's, that's an important point. Well, that, I think it takes it to our next point. And, and I think everybody wants to know about this one because I'm not saying it's a no brainer if you can document really good results that everybody renews and wants to buy more. But if you can crack the code on documenting results, uh, improving value, uh, I think things just get a lot easier. So let's talk a little bit about, about that evolution. Uh, you mentioned some things earlier where you, 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 you talked about... Um, I'm just going to draw something that when we teach this, we call the triple metric and see if we can't riff off of this a little bit. 
a lot of companies recognize that they're putting a project in place and there's a red, yellow, green against the project. There's, there's um, like inputs that you just want to measure and make sure things are going okay. But the idea of reporting and rolling those up uh, to department level uh, and ultimately corporate level metrics and uh, let's use the word outcomes because I like using inputs and outcomes. Um, talk about this a little bit and the evolution of this and, and kind of where you think companies get, have to get to to be um, relevant in this land and expand game. The, uh, I, you know, when, they, when the SaaS market started, I, we all got, I think, a little... Um, a little misled, if you will, or a little confused, if you will, on the difference between um, on, on some of these measures. And I'll, I'll better articulate what I mean. In the early days, logins, monthly active users, these types of metrics were thrown around as, as success criteria, right? Oh, we, we, uh, everybody logs in or our login percentage is 94, 95%. And, and while that's interesting and also important, because it's tough to be successful if people aren't logging in, granted, but that doesn't mean that people are successful. That just means they're using it. So the difference between utility and success is a place that the industry um, has gone. I, I like to think that, that we've been helping drive this, but it's been our customers that have helped us drive this. Because utility does not, you know, those are independent events at times. So we think about success along the lines of what is different from our customer's customer's lens, right? So because, and that's just the market that we're in. We, we sell, this is all about customer experience for us. So we think about it as how is the world different for your customer's customer, okay? You also have just pure business metrics that you as an organization are expecting. I'm spending $10 million and I'm expecting to get a certain amount of results, right? I'm expecting to get more products per household. I'm expecting to get higher conversion rates. I'm expecting to take NPS up 10 points, right? Like whatever those internal business metrics are, to your point on outcomes, those are just outcomes of the difference that you've made for your customer's customer. And logins and MAUs and those, while interesting and, and, I, and I would argue still important, those can't be the benchmark for what success looks like uh, for any of us selling in this market anymore. Our customers are requiring more. Um, we certainly require more from partners that sell to Salesforce, the technology that we use that is not you know, a Salesforce technology because everything that we sell, we use. Um, but there's certainly capabilities that, that we need from other technology providers. And our lens has changed in how we think about it as well. That this is about outcomes. This is about um, both the qualitative and quantitative difference in business, uh, business outcomes. So you mentioned a few. So I'm picturing, so the customer's customer. So you guys are customer experience, customer relationship management, and in, I'll draw in three, in true Salesforce 360, I will try to use the Salesforce color and, uh, and <laughs> in, encircle the customer's customer. And so the picture I have, and even going back to the corporate vision is you paint a vision of impact, your customer, Salesforce's customer, how they impact their customer. And, yeah. and each of the nodes on the 360 have their own sort of impact on the customers, your customer's customer. Yes. Um, and then you're saying, uh, so what's the attachment then to business metrics and customer's customer impact? Can you give me some examples in the difference between the two? So just our, our folks can understand like what they may sound like. Yeah, I, you know, I think the um, things for us that are customer's customer um, types of things are, um, this is around what is the customer in our world, right? So mm -hmm. specific to CRM, what is the customer experience, right? So are our customers engaging with us more deeply? Are we able to sell more products? Those are internal metrics, right? But those are essentially outcomes of what you're delivering. Again, in our world, those are outcomes of how you're leveraging and being enabled by Salesforce solutions to deliver those different experiences for customers. Right. So 
the, the lens is, is a little bit nuanced for my, the point that I'm trying to make is those metrics that we use internally to even if you thought about just validating any, any purchase of any solution has to be through the lens of what world in the CRM market have to be through the lens of how is the world for your customers different? Yeah. Well, and I, I just like the fact that I was able to uh, alliterate that with, uh, you know, looking at the customer's experience, maybe yeah. they've, they've now have a better experience. Maybe things have gotten faster um, and they've just, you know, things get resolved quicker or all the other things in the experience. They're engaging more. They're locked and loaded with you. And then ultimately the measure is, are they doing more with you? Correct. Probably maybe even in sort of this order, I have an experience that's great and getting better. So then I engage there for more. And then I expand with you customers, customer doing that, which then I guess I would, these things would flow up into business metrics, right? They, so, they, dead on. And I, it, you know, for, again, in our world, this is about providing amazing customer experiences, amazing customer experiences for our customer, right? So our customers that we work with, are we enabling them to have a neighbor to have amazing new experiences, to have experiences that they've never had before? Are they allowed to, are they now enabled to engage with customers in brand new ways? Those are the things that we think about. The outcomes of those are, oh, I, I'm on the Adidas website and I just bought an amazing pair of shoes. I was engaged online. I had chat with a customer service representative. That product was out of stock. I was immediately notified. I was then in a journey now with Adidas and they just came out with a brand new product and I just got an ad and an offer for it. And now I'm back in that opportunity because I had an amazing, I'm just using Adidas as an example. I had an amazing customer experience. I'm going to keep doing that. If I didn't have an amazing customer experience, I'm not going to. So that's why that lens is important. And that's when we engage with customers, we're thinking about our customer's customer. The internal business metrics are clearly our customers, but the right, lens right. has to be outward, not inward. And I guess the assumption is if you, if you help the customer's customer do all those things, the business and metrics will follow Correct. because they're, they're, they're driven by their, their customers, customer success. And so I think that's a, I'm trying to figure out if that's a luxury of the market you serve or if any market, any SaaS company that's here today listening can say, yeah, my customer's customer. What if I could help them measure some improvements there um, and, and, and then back that into the business metrics? That's a whole nother level of, of, of outcomes to be talking about. So let me ask on a scale of one to five again, folks in your chat box, um, five being we are looking at our customer's customer's metrics as a way to show our impact and demonstrate our outcomes on the business success of our clients. Um, five, yeah, we are looking at the customer's customer. Or one, we're, we're, we're barely measuring utility right now. Uh, let's see where everybody's at. So two, three, four, five. All right, congratulations. Uh, looks like Anne, that went by pretty, pretty fast. Um, twos and threes. Um, so yeah, some things, somebody's talking about uh, being able to uh, actually see what's happening, predict what's happening, and then adjust to actually fix it some more. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of data passing back to you guys where you can improve the customer's customer impact in real time almost, I would think, with the kind of information that your customers are getting. Yeah, and Tim, to your, to your point, and Pam just, um, Pam and we're like kinetically aligned with Pam at this point. <laughs> The, uh, the, the point of the customer's customer, I'll give you an example of, because it, this doesn't just have to be out external to your organization, right? You have internal, the word customer, it, big C, little c. If you're selling into human resources, well, your customer is the employee, right? You could argue that your customer is the employee. It's still within your walls, but that is your customer. So I don't want everybody thinking that it's necessarily the customer's customer is outside of your four walls as an organization. The word customer can apply to a lot of different things. You know, in the transportation logistics industry, you could argue the customer is the consignee, person's the receiving the shipment. You could also argue, and they think about it, we think about it this way with our transportation logistics companies, the customer is also the driver. That's a really important customer. So 
the, cust the, the word customer can be thrown around a lot. That's where it's important in your circle here to really identify who is that that you're solving for. And it's okay to have more than one because you're gonna have different paths and different journeys for each. That's important. And uh, I think that the idea here that first you get a mindset and then you start to figure out who they are and, and where you can create a journey of impact that, that one, you can impact it, two, you can measure it, measure it and three, <laughs> your clients care about it uh, is, is, is part of that. So I guess my question is, when you think of, again, I know it's a culture, but when you think of AEs and CS and the different roles, where do the outcomes, who owns the outcomes, who, who aggregates those and turns them into something meaningful for the customer? Same, uh, similar answer to, to what I gave you. So the, before, and, and we account executive, account director, account manager, the different names in the, in the industry. Ultimately, that person is responsible um, in our world for deploying the right resources consistently in that journey to make sure that we're measuring our points in time that we have the rigor around it. They aren't typically doing it. You know, keep in mind, a lot of these business value people um, are in our world are, you know, ex McKinsey, ex Bain. They're very, very well educated around business value and aligning corporate strategies and initiatives and metrics and everything else. So we don't, we don't expect our AEs to be able to do that work. We expect our AEs to be able to organize um, and be thoughtful and be the, um, the deliverer, if you will, the owner of that process to get the work done very similar to how we think about customer success through that entire journey. It's, it's incumbent on our account executives um, to be able to do all of that. So when you think about what's in our portfolio, you think about the complexity with some of our customers, it's certainly high end in the market. You think about all of that, that's a big role for our account executives to do. That role is about bringing in the right people at the right time to support customer success um, in addition to thinking about that, you know, that selling engagement moments. Yeah, big job. And, uh, and, and it's good. You're, you're a company with a lot of resources and you've figured out how to manage them all. That's awesome because um, the story, uh, as we've observed it as a marketplace of Salesforce is, is the stuff of legends. Um, you've been a huge part of it, Larry. I appreciate, uh, appreciate uh, you joining us here today. If anybody has a last minute question, why don't you type it here? I'm about to uh, give you a freebie. Um, and uh, it, it, it is an ebook and uh, I'll get this working here in a second. Oh, let me see here. Um, all right, good question. And then I'll, I'll get us to the freebie. Uh, how do you balance the customer success importance versus growth expectations for your AEs? Both are important. That's a great question. Yeah, can I just go with the yes? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's not Pam, so I, I, I can't. <laughs> so we have to let somebody else get in on the game here. No, I, uh, I, so it's an awesome question. I, uh, this, is, this is a journey for us in that um, the, the answer has to be yes. I think we also recognize that we will not get to that next revenue opportunity with our customers if we haven't had success. So this becomes a little bit of uh, like that wheel has to get in motion. And we've been blessed enough to, to both recruit fantastic account executive talent and train account executive talent um, where that motion again is embedded in the, in the DNA or you learn it very quickly here. The customer success is the quickest path for you to drive ACV. There is not an ACV event or a net new opportunity event without customer success, unless it's a new logo. And then if it is a new logo or a new customer that you're working with, we, we need to be describing that customer success journey. If we aren't doing that, then you won't have the second opportunity. So we embed that in a lot of our sales enablement practices. We, we embed that in the, how do you work at Salesforce? Uh, as a big company now, how do you work at Salesforce and what are the core values of our company? And when we rotate back to trust and customer success, we know that that has to be the motion. Um, we cannot just go out and keep turning cranks and, uh, and closing new opportunities without the customer success lens. 
So there's my yes, there's my long winded. There's your long yes. Well, right, exactly. I mean, here's the thing I've learned about when I've seen some of our companies try to decide, should we have hunters and farmers? And then what I discover is they put people into quote unquote farmer roles who don't know how to close business. They're good support service customer success people, but they don't know how to run uh, an opportunity or a, manage a, uh, an, 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 an opportunity. So you do need both and. You gotta be able to close a business and drive success. Um, so I, I have a, um, I don't think, so we must have some corporate visions fans here, Larry. So Larry was generous enough to say at the beginning that we have a great partnership together. Um, everybody's like, so do you use CVI techniques? If, what, if, what in the expansion sale book do you guys use specifically? I don't think Larry's at liberty to talk about that and I'm not gonna put him in that position. Um, but I do appreciate the corporate visions fans out there asking that question. Yeah, um, I do. If you want to take um, Gerald's, because uh, Gerald, I think um, uh, you might have mentioned that the IBM and the partner thing a couple of times, I, I, that's important. Um, we have a, a very wide, it's not specific to IBM, um, a very wide partner network that we partner with, um, no pun intended, around customer success. Uh, ultimately, our partners don't own the renewal. That's, that's on Salesforce. So that relationship with our partners has to be super close and super integrated. We have to present um, and work with our customers in a combined uh, view and lens of who's doing what roles. Um, but our partners have been fantastic and transformational for us in advancing and aligning the vision. But ultimately it's Salesforce's responsibility to help ensure success so that we have a customer for life. I try to figure out if Gerald worked for IBM based on those questions. I can't. <laughs> I, IBM's an amazing, an amazing yeah. partner, um, and we're we're very fortunate to to work so closely with them, both on you know them as an organization that we sell to, and also all the work that we're doing for our customers together. Awesome. Here's what I was trying to offer. So we are trying to give away some of the ideas uh, and frameworks. Here is an ebook for you. It's a fun interactive ebook to help folks uh, learn some of the frameworks for messaging to renewals or messaging to upsells and price increases uh, and such. So we're sharing that uh, in the link uh, as well in the, in the chat. Larry, uh, I don't know if you have any parting words for the folks. This has been awesome. Thank you for sharing the wisdom. Uh, everybody looks up to Salesforce and it was very kind of you to share some of those inside, uh, insider moments so that people could learn uh, from the industry leader. Any other parting thoughts that you have? No, I, I, uh, it's not lost on me that probably a lot of folks attending are Salesforce customers. So thank you for all your support. Uh, keep pushing us to do uh, better, more innovative things. We appreciate the partnership. And Tim, thanks so much for the time. It's great to see you. All right, thanks everybody. You'll be getting uh, the notes that I took such as they were and uh, a recording of this afterwards. So you can go back and listen to the parts that uh, you want to dig a little deeper in or share. Uh, but until the next webcast, thanks again, Larry. Good seeing you. Take care and everybody be well. Thanks. Bye -bye. Everybody.